record that. Excellent. We're now recording. Well, welcome to class number two. Oh, you guys cannot see my screen. Huh? I don't know what that is. Let's see here. Let's see if this fixes that. Okay, perfect. So as I uh as I illustrated last class, you already have access to the lectures that I did last semester. I had uh, provided those. So I'm probably gonna deviate a little bit from the slide deck because you already have lectures right off the slide deck. And I'm gonna probably try to motivate with more source code examples in today's lecture. But the first part of the course is just to kind of do a quick overview of the essential C PDF. So when we looked at the, um, when we looked at the, uh, the syllabus, the syllabus had the required textbook. In fact, let me open that up so that we can see. Actually, let me go, let me see here. Let me go to here, lectures. Let me go to the syllabus. So if I go to the syllabus for the class, if I went to the textbook section in the syllabus, students, grades, responsibilities, objectives. Okay, here we go. The prereqs, course summary. Here, this right here. So I had illustrated that we have the textbook, which you should be able to get through your full access from the university as a digital textbook. But in addition to that, there's these two recommended uh, text here, the essential C.pdf and the uh, Unix programming tools. So we're going to do a quick run through of the essential C just to kind of get you up to speed on the C programming language. And we'll emphasize this by actually running some simple C programs that we can compare and contrast to Java, which you should all have about two semesters of experience in. And also we can compare and contrast. Well, we're not going to contra contrast too much from assembly yet, but uh, Java will be, I think, our, our main kind of measure of what we're going to compare against. So with that said, let me jump back to the slide deck. So I have this slide deck, but I'm going to kind of jump around with it. The basic uh, overview of what we have here, if we were to look at the essential C PDF, and in fact, let me actually... I bring it to this point. Let me, let's actually jump to that PDF. So let me highlight this here. Let me jump here, open up a tab, put that in there. And we can see that this should bring straight to a PDF that has X amount of sections. You'll see that we'll walk through all these, these different sections. So if you haven't had a chance, I would recommend everyone to go and not only start reading your chapter one in the textbook, but read this, uh, read through this PDF. You don't have to read it completely, like make, like skim it, skim the table of contents, skim the topics. And if there's something that you feel like you're already familiar with, right, skip to the next part. So like, for instance, I mean, they have entire paragraphs on comments. And the comments in Java and the comments of she are very similar. But this will at least give you an idea of what you can do with C and the syntax in which to do it with. Uh, and you can kind of use your knowledge in Java to compare and contrast. And this is all going to lead us up to the very first lab, which is going to be just a basic C programming lab. And so I haven't officially posted that yet. I want to do a little bit of a crash course in today's lecture. And then I'll probably go ahead and publish that. We'll probably look at some C code today and we'll look at some more C code uh, tomorrow. And then we might actually kind of work through the first lab together uh, jointly. Okay, so yeah, it's a, it's a pretty decent sized document at about 45 pages, but it's, it's a lot of the concepts you'll see that's kind of spaced out and organized in a very easy way. And we'll, we'll run through this in terms of the slide deck. So after showing you the PDF, the overview, as you can see, is going to be uh, uh, what are the basic types and operators in C? What are the control structures in C? What are the complex data types in C? What are the functions 
And then there's various other interesting bits that's in the document, like odds and ends, advanced arrays and pointers, and the operators and the standard library references. So I'm not going to kind of beat you over the head with the slide deck, because I've already done that. If you want that experience, you can go and consume that. Let's look at some source code instead. So the first piece of source code that I want to look at that we can kind of immediately distinguish is going to be um, a simple Hello World program. Can everyone read that? Do I need to enlarge that for the class? Is that better? Well, so that's a, that's a good request. Unfortunately, that TV is having technical difficulties. But if you need, I can I can. Okay, perfect. Yeah, at the same time, I'm I'm recording this. So if you, I'm, I'm not only recording, but I'm also broadcasting this on Zoom. So feel free to be able to log into these machines and actually join the Zoom channel, even if I'm right here, so you could see my screen if you're having difficulties. Uh, where is the Google Drive link for for the uh, PowerPoint? That you can That's a great question. So let me see here if I if I'm uh, remembering this correctly, and let me go here because I don't know which of my various work spaces my Discord's in. So let's actually go to Activity Monitor and kill the process so I can launch it. So okay, let's kill Discord. Okay, Discord, you're gonna die. Bye. And once this has been successfully terminated, I'll relaunch Discord, and I believe I have it inside of Discord. So let's take a quick look at our server again, since this is the first time we actually get to see each other face-to-face. -face. Very strange first day, where the first day of class, we had to go remote because of weather, which didn't actually come, I don't think. Okay. It did uh, later that day, though, right? Uh, is this, is this not? Okay. Let's see here. Please don't pull me out of my workspace. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, relaunching Discord. Oh, I got an echo. Is someone's microphone on that's listening to me by chance? And here, while we're doing this, let me make sure there's no comments. There's no comments here. Excellent. And the internet's not so strong here, huh? I have two bars. Hopefully that's not gonna mean any impactful things as we go on. Now, while we're doing this, if you have a computer, I just want to make sure that everyone can log into the web terminal. Has everyone tried doing webterminal.cs.uno.edu? So we kind of looked at that on the first day of lecture, but if you want to have a chance, that's going to be your workspace where you're going to be able to go ahead and write and author all of your code and be able to test code as we and, and your labs as we go through uh, the semester. So just make sure that you can log into that. You should be able to use your... Uh, credentials, your UNO credentials to be able to do that. So while I'm waiting for this, I will so that should be webterminal.cs.uno.edu. And it should bring you to a page similar to this where you should be able to select to do like a systems lab. And then if you go into there, it should allow you to launch that into that space we kind of explored last class, yeah, connecting to guacamole. That's effectively the web service that allows us to have a browser-based environment that is your desktop, so a remote desktop environment into your own uh, environment here. I'm getting the connection error. That might be because too many things are trying to connect at once, but that's okay. I'm going to work locally on my own machine, so I'm not, I'm not tethered to meeting online 
availability for when I lecture. That's okay. There we go. So here now that I can log into there. Let me see. Let me log in with my UNO credentials. And so then that would then log me in here. Excellent. And then once I'm logged in, this is just like a Ubuntu desktop that's pre-configured with all the software that we're going to need for the semester. So you don't have to worry about configuring anything yourself as long as you can access this workspace. And you can access this workspace either through these computers that are directly in front of you, or you could do it from a browser on your laptop or desktop at home or whatnot. And all the files are actually just housed right in our data center. So it doesn't matter what machine you're at, whether you work on uh, one of these desktop computers for, or one of these uh, um, small clients, or whether you work on your laptop or if you pivot back and forth, that's fine. Like your files carry over because remote, you're remoting into our data center from any of these uh, access points effectively. And of course you can just click here to launch a terminal. So this is the shell application. This is effectively what we're gonna learn how to use and how it operates throughout the course of the semester, right? So this is what you've probably been using to compile and run your Java code. So now we're going to kind of learn how to use it in kind of a, a much, a much more appropriate way, a much more uh, um, active way than just issuing some uh, keywords and uh, uh, initiating some applications from it. Okay, so let me close out of this and see, or instead of close out, yeah, let's do this. Let's go back to the Discord then. Okay, so going to Discord, we have our Discord server right here. And so the question was, where can we get the links to the documents and whatnot? Now, I would hazard to guess if we go to the resources section here. So there's a ch resources channel where uh, we've actually started to build up a collection, a dialogue of people sharing various resources. But I think if you go to the pinned message, and I hope this is pinned. If it's not, I'll pin it now. Um, pin message. Okay, I'll pin this message now. There we go. Yeah, pin that. Okay, so now if you go into the resources section, if you look, if you haven't used Discord before, you can always see what messages are pinned in a particular channel. So if I clicked pinned messages, it'll now show lecture slides. And so here will be the link of uh, lecture slides that you have available. And I decided to do something very experimental. Uh, I decided to go ahead and not only give um, read privileges, on these lecture slides, but you also have authoring privileges. So we're gonna trust that no one deletes all of the lecture slides so no one else can see it. Now, I actually have lecture, these same lecture slides reserved so that if you do delete them, that's fine. I can always replace them. But the experiment here, because you're, you're probably wondering why would I give right access to everyone in the class or everyone who has this link, it's so that we can try to collaboratively, if you have these if you have access to these slides, if you find that they're cluttered, if you find that they're not uh, uh, consolidating the material well, feel free to edit them. Feel free to improve what's already there so that as we keep passing from class to class to class, we could see how we're collectively transforming the beginning forms of the data that we start with and make it more coherent so that it's crystal clear for everyone. So feel free to actually contribute towards the slides if you want. That's exactly why I did that. It's uh, a bit of an experiment, haven't done that before, but you know, I, I don't think anyone's changed the slides actually last semester, but I'm advocating that you can do that. That's, that's why I did do that. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, I think another thing I'll probably do here is, um, let me go here since I'm in here. Let me go to um, server settings. Let me go to overview. Uh, it's just fine. Escape out of that. Let me go to invite people. Let me go to uh, edit link. Let's make uh, let's make sure that this never expires. There's no limit. Generate that link. Copy it. Okay. So now let me 
cancel out of this. Let me jump over to the departmental server, which is here. I'm going to go into 2467, which is here, and I'm just going to drop the invite. So for any reason you have not joined the Discord server, you can now go to the 2467 systems channel inside the departmental server and access the course server there. And again, as you as you join, what I'll start to do is give everyone a role of CSCI 2467. And it's very colorfully this like orange color so that you can see who your cohorts are. And uh, let's see, what are the other roles? The yellow are gonna be people who are instructors or had served as instructors previously. Let's see, I'm going to go to actually the announcement section because a lot of in the announcement section kind of details the all the mechanisms of the server. So we have a couple different channels, right? The announcements is if I need to broadcast anything, I can publish it here. General talk, you can just talk about whatever is related to the class. Uh, videos are going to be published. The link will be published here and it'll be updated. So I still have to publish Monday's lecture. So after this lecture finishes processing, I'll go ahead and probably reserve uh, a Wednesday evenings or Thursdays to uh, publish the, the lectures. And uh, let's see here, and then the resources. And again, feel free to contribute to the resources. So you can see I provided the resources I have here, but you can also see that you have some students from last semester who had contributed. And again, we can have this kind of evolutionary process where we create a compendium of shared uh, knowledges. And when I need to go ahead and alert you of anything, I can always do this as well, just so you know. So if I do at CSCI 2467, hello, if you have that role, it should send you an alert. So again, this is gonna be the best way for me to go ahead and alert you as I update any course content or have to share any information. I'll also so send email out, but I do prefer to use Discord. Okay, so let me close out of this. Actually, I'm just gonna kill Discord. Okay. So now let's go back to my original plan. This is very big. There, okay, perfect. Okay, so let's take a quick crash course in C. So we should always start, or it's typical, whenever you start to learn a new programming language to start with Hello World, right? I think that's probably what you did in 1583 with Java. And there was a lot of, boilerplate code that you needed in order to do that. There's gonna be a, a little bit of boilerplate code. Uh, the first thing we're gonna see is that C code is by default, not natively an object-oriented language. So you, you have to understand Java is the product of evolutionary steps in programming languages. So before, so C existed before Java did, and so as software gets sufficiently complex, this concept of object-orientedness solves a lot of the scalability problems. This is why OOP design is such a powerful concept and a powerful tool. Uh, at the same time, uh, there are reasons why your code does not have to be object oriented, right? Like uh, your, your code could be procedural. It could be made up of a collection of functions. So before, before you had this metaphor of object orientedness, you had your code base as just broken up as a collection of function calls. Now notice I'm using the word function calls here, right? In Java, you probably call them methods. And in assembly, you probably call them procedures. Right? Am, am I correct? Is that your experience so far? So let me kind of uh, uh, crystallize some of these terms for the most part. Um, I'm gonna state that a method is a behavior like a function that defi that's defined inside of a class. 
So if you have a function that is inside of the scope of a class, we now call that a method. So now if we have a function that's in the global namespace, that means it doesn't belong to a class, that's when we call it a function. So in, the, in higher level languages, when we call, if, 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 if we're not starting to encapsulate our code base across classes, which is a very object oriented approach, then we're, we're doing procedural code where we're, we're producing a collection of functions. So since C existed before objects existed, it uses a procedure, a procedure first approach. So, so just like Java, we need to have a main function as the launch point of our application. In fact, Java got that from C. Remember that Java's is the child language of the C family. So it started with C, and then from C was C++, which is the object-oriented version of C. It's literally object-orientedness bolted onto C. So you could do C programming in C++, and you could do object-oriented programming in C++. In fact, if you might recall, the plus plus is the increment operator. So the developers of C++ was kind of making a small joke about it being an upgraded version of C. So if you ever wondered why it was called C++ and not C++ or whatever, or C2, that's, that's what it is. It's C, C incremented. Add it with object orientedness. Okay, so extending off of that joke, or I guess humor, I don't know if it's a joke, but that kind of programming, Programmer humor, which is always really bad, trust me. Um, have, has everyone heard of the uh, the language of C sharp? Okay, so that's using the same kind of concept, right? So if C plus plus is an increment on C, is anyone here familiar with uh, with uh, music notation? So yeah, C sharp would be the next note up from C. So again, it's just a deviation of the same kind of programming humor whenever you kind of upgrade, uh, you have these upgrades in the C family. So if you haven't seen C sharp, I, I'm assuming, has anyone done C sharp in here? Oh yeah, so, so this is the thing about C sharp. C sharp is effectively like Microsoft's version of Java. So the syntax and the concepts that drive C sharp are very similar to what you have in Java. So if you know how to code in Java, it would take very little effort to look at the minute uh, kind of syntactical differences to start programming in, in C Sharp. And the reason why, for instance, you might want to program in C Sharp, if you are interested in game development, you might use Unity, Unity's code base, usually the code that you're gonna write in Unity is gonna be C Sharp. So if you take game dev one, if you take game dev two, you're gonna, have to write your game code in C sharp, which again, very similar to Java. It's almost, it's almost exactly the same. Uh, it's just very small, small differences. And so there's also a lot of, um, uh, and then uh, you have your .NET framework as well. So if you're gonna develop inside of any kind of uh, Microsoft ecosystem, clearly C sharp is gonna be the language of choice there. Whereas if you're gonna, uh, develop on like a uh, an Oracle ecosystem, then it would be Java. But it's very easy to jump between those two platforms. But I mean, suffice it to say, that entire family starts with C because that's what uh, the uh, creators of Unix wrote in terms of the programming language. And this is why it motivates why we're doing uh, learning C for uh, system programming concepts. But then C has expanded and is still uh, or the C language has expanded and still exists in a very dominant position even to this day, like like several, several decades since its inception. And that would be in order C, C++, then C Sharp and uh, Java would all be part of that. Okay, so with that said, that was a lot for me to say to, to get to the hello world, which is that we're going to declare a function. So when we declare a function, the notation is gonna be pretty similar to what we do with Java, right? We have a return type. I'm, go I'm gonna start with the code itself and then we'll talk about what's happening above that code. So we have a return type. 
So I believe in Java, our return type for the main method is what? Well, that's it's it's input, but what does it return back? It's usually what? It's public, static, void. void, right? So in Java, nothing gets returned back. In C, we're actually returning back an integer. The idea is that when we run our main function, it will return zero if the application executed successfully. And it returns a non-zero value if there was some kind of error. And then inside of our main function, we could return whatever that non-zero value is to indicate where the error occurred at that caused us to crash at. So this is a this allows your application to provide meaningful numerical input or output, I'm sorry, to the end user to let them know whether you had successfully um, uh, executed or not. So unlike in uh, Java, we're going to have an int as the return value. Then we're going to name our function the same way, right, main. And so we don't need any parameters inside of our main function. And then what we can see here is now, recall that in Java, whenever you go ahead and author any software, there are standard libraries that are automatically imported into there, right? It was all, that was pretty much covered in either uh, 1583 or 2120. I'm assuming, right? So, so the reason why you have access to, say, for instance, the string, and actually, let's look at this for a moment. Let's let's jump to the API just so we can compare. So, if I say string, Java API, everyone has looked at the Java API before. I'm assuming. Okay, so we could see that the package that string is a part of is the Java Lang package. This one right here. By default, uh, I want to go to not object. Does it let me access just the Lang package? Oh, well, doesn't matter. So by default, anytime you go ahead and compile your Java application, it automatically imports all the contents of java.lang for you. Now, the, over the course of building Java software, you would also import external classes that weren't imported for you by the Java compiler, such as java.util, right? That was one that you had to externally import in order to get the available functions and classes to be able to instantiate and use. So just like you have your standard libraries that are part of your Java code base that you can then import to be able to use into your source code for Java, we have that same concept in C. And so the way that we would import code, import um, some of these, uh, these external uh, files, uh, uh, the uh, uh, functions and classes or functions into our C code would be to use this preprocessor directive. So we're going to go ahead and use a hashtag include, which lets the C compiler know, hey, there's another set of C functions that we're going to have to access and call upon in order for this application to do its job. So just like you had an import keyword in Java, we will do hashtag include, which is a directive to the compiler, the, the C compiler, to go to the, the, um, to the um, standard library. Whenever we put anything in angle brackets, that means it's part of the standard library. So that's how it knows what the pathway is to find those source code files. And so if this was authored code, 
you would use a file path of where that C code would be at effectively or the, so actually we see we're doing a dot H and we have a dot C. We're gonna talk more about this probably next class, but I'll kind of give you a preview that dot H is effectively stands for header, a header file and our dot C stands for our C code file. So all of our source code, the nitty grittiness of our implement implementation goes into the file that would be called dot C. And so we can see in my text editor here with the code that I have opened up, it's in a dot C file. Now, when it comes time to build large enough source code files, and we'll talk more about this in terms of how does a compile compiler turn your source code into an actual application? Like what does that look like inside of your system? Uh, and it has to do a lot with being able to link. We'll see a lot of this. I wanna say that's actually gonna be in the first lab. We're gonna look at a lot of that in the first lab. Um, but suffice it to say, the idea of, um, an API, a set of just function calls is effectively what your header file is. So let's let's put it this way. Do you remember in Java when you were able to declare a function effectively as being abstract? And so when when it's abstract, you don't have the implementation. You've effectively just declared what the name is what the return type is and what the set of parameters are, correct? And so that creates a interface on how you can access that function. So if you think of an interface, and when I say interface, think about what API stands for, application programming interface. So when we look at documentation, like let's go back to the Java, API here. When I look at the when I look at the actual documentation, and let me move this off to the side here. So what it, it's it's effectively producing to you as the end user the same thing that an abstract class or abstract function, or I'm sorry, abs an abstract method in Java provides to the rest of the Java compiler, right? So here it's giving you oh, what is the return type? What is the name? And what is the parameters in here? And then it gives you a human readable description. So I don't know if the dots were connected or not, but an API document is very similar conceptually for you, the developer, as it is for the compiler for abstract methods. It's an interface to say, this is the set of functions that exist, this is what these functions legally need as input. And this is what these functions will produce as output. And given that amount of information, you don't need to know how it's implemented because it's a black box style of programming, right? It's encapsulation. You're only concerned about what you've been tasked to implement. And you're going to trust that any external function call that you didn't author yourself will take in the input it claims to take and then give you the appropriate output, right? So it's like a contract-based con uh, concept that drives how we develop our software. We are concerned about what goes into our own source code file. And then when we import external source code file, we look at the interface. For us as humans, it's the API documentation. For our system, it is the header information. So when you have a header file, the header file simply is a file that, that contains all of the function names, the parameters, and what gets returned back. And so that's the difference between a header file and a C, code, a C file. The C file cont contains all the source code files, where the header files are just used to check and verify that the way that we're using the functions inside these external source code files is correct. 
so that when the compiler goes to compile it, it's going to trust the header file in terms of providing the set of parameters and then getting the return state of the, the values back. Okay, so let me go back over here. Okay, so I have right here, whenever you see STD, in the context of computer science, you could think of that as being shorthand for standard, usually for standard library. So when I have STDIO, that's an abbreviated way of saying this is the standard input output. So just like Java had system.out that allowed you to have all the class functionality to access the output stream, and just like Java had system.in that kind of encapsulated all of the standard libraries function and method calls for the accessing the input stream, that, that concept that Java uses was drawn from this, the standard input output library that we can import from uh, the standard library from C. And so we have to import that if we want to call an external function that we did not implement. Now, the external function we did not implement but want to use is going to be the print statement. Now, in particular, the year in Java, there are multiple print statements. You had print, you had print ln, and you have print f. My favorite print statement, the most powerful and expressive print statement is print f, the formatted print statement. That is the print statement we will be using throughout the semester. So, I'm going to import the set of functions from the standard input header file, which will now give me access to the printf function. And a printf function, we'll see, as we look at some more of the source code files, can have a number of different parameters. In fact, the printf function uses, is used the same way it's used in Java. So if you use it in Java, which I, I'm expecting you did, right? Did everyone use printf in Java? Perfect. Then you're already familiar with it. Then it needs at least one parameter. And again, C supports function overloading. That concept of function overloading was pioneered by C and then adopted in all of the uh, languages that inherited from C effectively. So the at least one parameter is going to be the data that you want to go and print. In this instance, I'm going to create a string literal. We define a string literal with double quotations, the exact same way we create string literals in Java. And so here, notice I'm going to do hello world, and then I'm going to do my escape character, I'm, uh, uh, my new line character, I'm sorry, my new line character to go ahead, which is a escape uh, sequence. You have forward slash, and then the end to do new line, and that should then print out hello world. Now here, I don't need this. Let me get rid of that for now. This is this should be all I need. That, that, that other import we don't need yet, but I'm gonna talk about in the next uh, source code example. Okay, so here, let's go ahead and actually try to compile this. Does anyone, before I try to compile, does anyone have any questions? Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna go here. And so let me start by saying we can use our shell application to access a C compiler to compile our source code file into a uh, um, executable file. So if I if I do uh, ls here, we could see yeah I'm already in the directory that in, that includes a lot of my pre-authored C files that I'd like to kind of step through today. And so here, instead of Java C, which was our compiler application that translated Java source code file into a Java object code, which is executable by the JVM, we'll use the new C compiler family, new spell GNU. And so this is abbrevi this is initialized to GCC. So the GCC has a number of different, it's a family of compilers. 
One of them is for C code. Another is also very popular for C++ code. So, in fact, I can do here C, GCC. And again, you, you should be able to access this if you're following along with me on your uh, web terminal, which you don't have to. Like, I'm recording this so that you can pay attention to what I'm saying now. But if you happen to be logged in and you have your terminal open, you should be able to do GCC. And then we're going to pass a flag value. Let me see. Is it dash dash version? And so whenever you usually... When we go ahead and execute a command line application from the shell, we give it whatever the application name is, right? So GCC is an application that already is installed in my system. And if I want to check, I can see the version of it. So you can always usually provide a uh, flag value, which is usually a dash and a single letter. So like, for instance, I could probably do dash V for version or dash dash and the more kind of expressive full name. So I don't have to remember what does V mean? What does lowercase O mean? What does uppercase O mean? So the, the power of the double dash is the expressiveness. So you're like, ah, oh, I want the version. So here, this is just reporting metadata on my compiler. In fact, one of the things you should be aware of if you're going to familiarize yourself with being able to work comfortably at the shell level is how can you access information about the applications and the various flag values you can send to the applications to kind of control how the application works inside of this environment. So there are what are called man pages. So if you type in typically like man, short for manual, GCC, it'll look up to see if there's a man page there. There's no man page there, unfortunately. <laughs> let's see if there, oh, so let's do another application. So another application that's usually pre-installed in all of our shell applications, or not pre-installed, but accessible by our shell applications is the LS application. The LS application is a very simple application that will go ahead and list the contents of a directory. But if I did not know that, I could type in man, short, uh, for, short for manual, and then the name of the application. And if that application has a set of app, uh, uh, documentation pages, I can now read those documentation pages here. So typically it would show, for instance, here, what is the, the keyword that launches the application. Then it gives you a human readable description about what this application does. It'll give you a quick synopsis, and then I can keep going through. It shows me all of the different options that use the dash, that flag value that it parses, and then how you can modify the output of this application based off of those flag values. And you can see LS has a lot of different, it has a lot of different values that you can pass to it. And then at any time, if you want to exit out of this, you can just hit Q and it returns you back to your prior state inside of your shell application. So I think what I'd like to do over the course of the semester is constantly look at how we can like query our shell app and utilize the applications that are already built into our shell application so we become more comfortable in this environment. And so one way for you to start exploring that is knowing to explore just doing man and then whatever the application is to, so you can read about it. Okay. So with that said, that was a bit of a, a detour, but one that was definitely worth taking, the scenic route towards Hello World. Let's try to compile our source code file with the GCC compiler. And again, GCC is short for GNU. I'm going to pronounce the G, GNU C compilers. Okay, so we're going to do GCC. And let me see if I can do dash H and query help. So instead of me just showing you, let's see what it expects. So dash help is usually gonna bring up your help file or you could be the more expressive dash dash help. And so here, just like the man pages for LS, sometimes applications will host its own set of documentation that's accept, uh, accessible, accessible through a help modifier, a help flag. 
So here, this is very similar to the man page we were looking at before, where we can scroll up. Oh, Lord, it's a lot of help. Okay, here we go. So here, it's going to give us a description. This is the C language set of compilers. It shows us how to use it. Uh, so right here, C lang, but for us, it's GCC. So GCC is an alias for C lang, right? For C language. And that's, that's by default. When we install the GCC compiler, it has the C lang compiler as part of it. So it gets invoked when we do GCC. And then they have all these different oper uh, operations, all these different flags you can give to it. So again, if you want to read more about how this application can be useful to you, what are all the options? You can query it, either with a help flag or a man page. Keep that in mind. That's one of the most invaluable things a software developer has in terms of their toolbox, is being able to read about what external code does or what external applications do. So if at any time you don't know how something works, don't just hammer away at the keyboard in frustration, start reading the documentation. Okay. Okay, so let me clear my terminal here. I'm going to type in clear. That's going to clear my workspace. All the history of what's been displayed. Okay, so we're going to do GCC. Okay, so GCC is not going to be too different from what you're used to in terms of compiling your Java code. The first thing it's going to look for is a C code file, a path to some C code file. So the one that we want to do now is going to be 00.hello.c. So this is one of the things that we instantly see is different. Let me highlight this. We can name our source code files anything. Remember that Java was very restrictive on what you could even call your source code files. Everything in Java had to be defined in a class, right? And so all of your classes had to be defined in files that shared the class name. And that's because that creates for Java the ability to enforce namespaces, so which, which helps when you're scaling your source code up. Because the, the, the thing about what makes Java so popular and why Java is still popular is in its scalability. If I'm going to write a application that's hundreds of thousands of lines of code, millions of lines of code, then you have to be able to be equipped to know when something fails, where exactly in the system it's, it's, it's having issues at. And so the only way you can get reliable reporting on issues on, on error checking and, and for, for maintenance purposes is by having a granular set of namespaces, having a scoping that says, I'm responsible for this code that kind of grows larger and larger and larger, right? So if you think about how does, let, let, let's map a code base to the way that other entities like large scale entities are or self-organized. Let's talk about how how a Java programming source code project might be like a, a corporate infrastructure. So imagine something like Starbucks, right? So Starbucks is compartmentalized in a lot of different layers of management, right? You would have, and starting from the lowest level, you'd have your individual store. Your store would have the individuals. That would be like your class files that are responsible for some task for that particular store. And then the store has a responsible agent, which is a manager. And then that manager reports to probably a district manager, which is responsible for all the stores in a particular district. And that district manager is responsible probably to a regional manager who manages all the various regions. And the regional manager is probably responsible to some kind of vice president of operations in a particular subregion, right? Like let's say the United States. And that VP is probably responsible for some other executive suite who overviews all operations. And then that would probably be responsible to the CEO at large. And so if at any time there's an issue, you can address it because of the scoping of where who's responsible where. 
So just like the way that these very large scale institutions can be able to operate on global scales, you can conceptually think, how can we break our code base such that it's executing instructions, it's executing its job inside of our system in a way that we can have a concept of responsibility. Who's the management to know when something has gone wrong and how do you escalate that and alert it so you can identify exactly where it happened so you can fix it. And so the reason why Java is the way it is is because it enforces namespacing, which is like that ability to encapsulate and say, ah, this thing is where it's broken at. Okay, that's a long way of saying C does not do that. I can name whatever I want in C, right? So I'm gonna name this source code file 00-hello because it's convenient and it allows me to order these little simple application files that we're gonna look at. Okay, so I'm gonna do GCC and then the name of my file, which is 00-hello.c. Uh, now, this is all I need, but let me show you what happens if I hit enter. If I hit enter, it's going to successfully compile, and I know it compiled because the default output, if I don't tell it to explicitly name my executable file something, it will, by default, call it a.out. Now, typically, we don't want the compiler to name our executable file for us, right? So I'm going to delete this. I can, I, I, I can invoke this. Actually, let me invoke it, but then I'm going to show you how we can do this even better. Cool. Get a little bit of lag in my system. I'm not even on a remote system. Okay, so if I do a dot out, so okay, when I go to execute a executable file, I would do dot slash. This indicates to the shell, hey, I'm about to give to you a executable file from this directory, from the local directory that I'm at. It's right now it's called a.out. So if I hit enter, it's not gonna execute that and it's gonna be, it's gonna display now to my console, hello world. So that works, right? We have a hello world, but let me show you how we can actually name our executable. So let me clear this. Let's delete our a.out. Oh, hang on. Let me do that another way. Let me ls. I see I have that a dot out. Let me delete that a dot out. So I'm going to do rm for remove a dot out. And we can see that's going to remove it from my terminal. Again, we should become more familiar with being able to access the shell to be able to do basic kind of file management, uh, authoring, and uh, just uh, text editing and whatnot, just general kind of conceptual things like that. Uh, try, if at all possible, to lean into shell applications over the course of this semester. Okay, so I'm going to remove that. And so now let me clear and let's do this another way. Let's do GCC. And now we're going to do 00-hello.c. And now I'm going to do a flag of dash O, which is short for output. And now I can give it an output name, such as uh, just hello. And now when I hit enter, we can see that the application, and we could see, at least inside my machine, the icon to indicate whether something's a file that should be opened by like a text editor and something that's an executable, something that kind of looks like this kind of console window. This now illustrates I now have an executable file. In fact, if I look here, Look at what the kind says. So all of these are C uh, source code files. It knows because of the extension .c. And then here it sees, oh, that's a Unix executable file. So now let me go here, dot slash, and then I can go, oh, yeah, hello. And I can go ahead and execute my application. So that is our first application in C. Okay. Is there any questions? Because I tried doing something like that man ls stuff earlier on my Windows shell and the command prompt and it didn't work. So that is a most wonderful question. And so let's talk about that. Um, 
So you have what's called a POSIX compliant shell application. This would be like Bash. This would be like C shell. Pretty much anything that is Unix based, which would be like Linux. This would be like Ubuntu. This would be like Mac OS. It's default command line application runs a POSIX compliant uh, um, set of, uh, of calls. So all the directives, all of the kinds of inputs that it would require are the same. So I can jump onto an Ubuntu machine, which is the one that you have access to web terminal. I could jump on my Mac OS. I can open up my terminal and we could do the same thing. Unfortunately, Windows, very early on before they were even Windows, I mean, they were, but when it was DOS, right? So before Windows existed, Windows is indicative of windowed applications, right? Things that are graphics-based, things that are event-driven, where you can click on a bot button and interact with your uh, operating system or uh, with your system. You can interact with your system through uh, user controls that are graphics. So that concept was revolutionary decades ago, and that's what drove the OS to be named Windows. It's like, oh, look, this is so much better than DOS because it has windowed applications. DOS is what Windows is built on top of, right? That's its legacy. So just like C, just like Java has a legacy where it inherited paradigms from C++ and before that C, Windows inherited its paradigms from DOS and DOS was its own set of command line directives. So you might be too young to really appreciate or experience what DOS was, but what natively is invoked inside of the command line on Windows is a callback, it's backwards compatible to old DOS systems. And so they enhance that. And there's another terminal that's also built into Windows called PowerShell, which is also a whole nother set of application names that are different than the POSIX compliant like Bash environment that we're working in. Now, Windows has realized it actually lost the console, the, the, the shell wars, so to speak. And so it has also now become fully compliant with a POSIX uh, uh, shell uh, standard. And so you have the ability to do what's called WSL. I want to say that's what it's called, Windows Subsystem Linux. So if you're on a Windows machine, if you want to be able to access the same kinds of, uh, if you want to access a, ba a Bash environment, like what I have on my Mac OS, or what you have on your Ubuntu environment through web terminal, look into doing WSL installation, and it'll allow you to actually get a Bash environment uh, natively in Windows without having to use the, in my opinion, much maligned uh, Git Bash environment. I am not a fan of Git Bash at all. The reason why I'm not a big fan of Git Bash, it's an external application made by a third party to op op serve as your system level application. Whereas WSL is made by Microsoft and partnered with Canonical, who does the package management for Ubuntu to give a seamless Bash environment from the actual OS provider. So if you're using Git Bash, I would recommend you switch to WSL if you want to work in a local environment on your Windows machine. And then you would have access to the man pages. You'd have access to all the, the other kinds of commands that we have on like every other actual uh, bash environment. But great question. I'm glad that you brought that up because that was, it, it has to do with historical reasons, but now Windows is finally has parity with Mac OS and uh, Linux based OS systems. But I do think you have to, you have to toggle it on. And then I think you can even switch when you open up a Windows terminal, I think you could type in like uh, PowerShell or Bash or whatever and allow you to toggle between the different environments. Now it's, now, with that said, I'll be honest with you. I haven't touched a Windows operating system in about a decade. So I couldn't show you really easily how to do that, but there's lots of great documentation out there to show you how to do that. Okay, excellent. Any other questions? Okay, I think we probably have enough time to go through at least one more C code script 
before we might run out of time. Maybe two. We'll see. We'll see how quickly we can run through this. Because again, I'm giving a lot of like I a lot of this I think you already know. Like I could have just showed this to you five minutes and you would have gotten most of this anyway. I, I seem to go on detour sometimes. But valuable ones. The scenic route is a route worth taking. Okay, let's uh let's take a look at the next one. So zero one bar dot c. This is going to be variables. How do we declare variables? And what are the primitive data types that are available to us in our C language? Okay, so here we're actually going to do two imports because this is an important thing to know. Boolean is not a primitive data type in C. So in Java, Boolean became a primitive data type, but in C, typically, whenever you want to have Boolean logic, it's actually representative as a numerical value. Zero represents false in any kind of control structure. So I can actually pass in, in fact, even here, this is just an alias. When I import standard bool, it's just creating a developer-friendly wrapper to express the concept of true or false. So it's more readable, so we don't have to use numbers, but under the hood, Boolean is simply a numerical value. Zero representing a false state, non-zero representing a true state. So one is true, minus one is true, 10,000 is true, zero is false. So, to illustrate that the standard library does include a wrapper for us so that we can kind of pretend to have a Boolean value, we can import a uh, standard bool.h. But we could just as legally just use zero and a non-zero number for any kind of expression that's Boolean or logical or uh, oriented. Okay, so let's take a quick look. We're going to walk through this code here. So we're going to declare our main function. And inside our main function is going to be all of the statements that we can go ahead and encode, just like in Java. So we're, we're going to notice that the way that variable declarations occur is very similar to Java. Again, Java got this from C. So it's going to be by type and then whatever label you want to apply to that variable. And then the concept of being able to declare or initialize or assign, exactly the same. Every statement ends in a semicolon, exactly the same. So here, for instance, I'm declaring an integer variable that I'll call my int, and I'll assign it a, a literal value of 100. And then I'll use printf the way you probably know how to use printf. I'm going to use the formatted string with a placeholder which is the percent sign, and then the type of data I want to insert or replace. And then as my second parameter, it's going to be a value that gets replaced with the percent D. So this will allow me to print out this integer. Okay, we also have characters, and character literals use the single quotation. Again, just like in C. I mean, Java. Java is just like C, but yeah, just like you're used to Java. And here, I'll print that by using the percent C, and recall, just like in Java, a character is simultaneously both a car literal or a numerical value, right? It's what binds or, or merges the concept of mapping our letters to integer values, key codes. Here we have our floating point value, which actually the literal value should be a F, just like in Java. And then I can, pro, I can print that out as percent %f. Then I can have double, which is double the precision. So remember, floats are 32-bit precision. Doubles are 64-bit precision, which is really important when we talk about how uh, radix point values are just approximations. So you want to get as much encoding for those approximate values to try to get them as close as possible as, as to what you expect them to be before you run out of encodable space. And so here we'll print that with a long float. 
percent LF. We'll use the only reason why we can do bool is because we imported it, which allows us to actually map true or false. But notice when we're printing it out, it's not percent B, it's percent D, because it's actually just a numerical value. Here, we don't have string data types. Notice even in Java, string was an uppercase S, which meant it wasn't a primitive data type. It was a reference data type. So very similar reference data type is going to be either arrays or pointers to something stored in memory. And so if we want to have more than one character, if we want to have a sequence of characters, that's effectively a character uh, array. So all Java is doing underneath the hood is it's giving you a class that organizes your character arrays in a defined name called a string so that you don't have to worry about it. But both in Java and in C, those aren't print, there's no language where it makes sense where that's a primitive data type. And we could articulate why later. Okay, here, this is another way, two different ways of declaring a string. I could either do it as a array, box notation, and then that's a collection. The, the double quotation is a string literal which is effectively creating an array of characters for us, or we can do that as a character pointer. So again, the string literal, the double quotation is producing effectively an array construct, but we can use a pointer to grab the memory address of where that array starts at. So pointers you should be familiar with a little bit from assembly, I would think. And we'll go more into this in detail later. Uh, we have the long data type in case the 32-bit encoding for an integer isn't large enough. Just like in Java, you can go larger with long. We also have shorts. You don't usually use shorts very often, but Java has them. C has them. You have um, unsigned integers, which means there's no concept of negative or positive, right? That's, it starts to be the minimal value in an unsigned number is zero. And then that gives you your entire encoding space, if it's 32 bits, if it's 64 bits, to be all positive values. So you can get an even larger number. That's usually really good for indexing because you can't have negative index numbers. So this allows you to have a huge index space. And then if you really need big numbers, you have double long, you have long long. Excellent. So with that said, let's just compile this code. Let's make sure it prints out what we'd expect it to print out. And then I think we would be pretty good. So let's go here, GCC. Um, okay, GCC. And then what is this? This is zero one dash uh, var C, then dash O for output. And let's just call this var, uh, var test. And so let's go ahead and actually run this code then. So here we're gonna do dot slash, var test and we're going to get all the output that we'd expect and notice that the character code the numerical value we have matches the uh so here the value what was it 65 is the same for a that works notice my string pointer prints and my character array prints right my long long so everything that we'd expect clearly all we did was store literal values into storage based off of variable naming and variable types, and then printed them out with print format statements. But so far, I think you could see this is very similar to how you program in Java. We're going to pick up from here next class if there's no questions. Excellent. Let me make sure there's no questions online. Okay. Let me 